one could say, that allow for the flourishing of all members of the community as far as that is possible. So it's important to note here that all members of the community refers to all entities, human and non-human. So the world, to me, created through Western epistemology does not account for all members of the community. While truth and fact are conflated in Western worldviews, their prioritization over respect has not made it possible for all members of the community to survive, let alone flourish. So the Western view of both the human and the non-human as exploitable resources is the result of what Cheney calls an epistemology of control, and it is indelibly tied to colonial colonization and capitalism. So uh, in a recent email, Jason Lewis, who's the primary investigator for Initiative for Indigenous Futures, says in reference to making relations with AI that our goal then is to develop relations that steer us away from enslavement and towards reciprocity and respect. Vine Gloria Jr., um, a, a Dakota philosopher, expresses a related sentiment about the enslavement of the non-human as if it were a machine. Lacking a spiritual, social, or political dimension in scientific practice, Deloria says, it is difficult to understand why Western peoples believe they are so clever. Any damn fool can treat a living thing as if it were a machine and establish conditions under which it is required to perform certain functions. All that is required is a sufficient application of brute force. The result of brute force is slavery. Slavery, uh, the backbone of colonial capitalist power and Western accumulation of wealth is the end logic of any ontology which considers any entity unworthy of relation. Deloria writes, respect involves two attitudes. One attitude is the acceptance of self-discipline by humans and their communities to act responsibly towards other forms of life. The other attitude is to seek and to establish communications and covenants with other forms of life on a mutually agreeable basis. I do not believe this is a question of machines deserving to be entities. Rather, it is a question of which ontologies we will choose to shape our worlds, uh, and whether these ontologies support an ethics which leads to slavery. Mastery and force are the actions of enslavement. And Dylan Rainforth points out in his essay how Aborigines invented the idea of object-oriented ontology. He writes, object and mastery and territorial possession are demonstrably part and parcel of the processes of genocide. Land or location, when reduced to the status of inanimate object, incapable of intelligence or agency, become resources to use and discard. When the logic of mastery and possession is exploded over an entire continent, every entity is possessed along with it. No entity can escape enslavement under an ontology which can enslave even a single object. Ontologies gain ethics from contextualization, relationships and communications within cosmologies, mythologies, and locations. But who or what can enter these relationships and be in relation? So specifically drawing from David C. Posthumus' analysis of Lakota ethnographies, one answer could be that which has interiority. I would like to argue that Lakota ontologies have been and are currently well suited for creating ethical and reciprocal relationships with the non-human. So, um, getting to this table, which is a little hard to read, but uh, in All My Relatives Exploring 19th Century Lakota Ontology Belief, Posthumus analyzes Lakota ontology through animism, uh, described by Philip Descalo, which distinguishes between two purposely vague and inclusive concepts, interiority and physicality. So, uh, Specifically for Lakota, this description of interiority includes uh, many elements of the world, including animals, spirits, ghosts, trees, rocks, meteorological phenomena, medicine bundles, regalia, weapons. These entities are capable of agency and interpersonal relationship, and loci of causality, says Posthumus. So uh, in table one here, I have, uh, I have organized Posthumus descriptions of Wakan, or uh, Khan for which he provides many definitions, um, uh, that which makes an individual. Uh, so uh, to me, I originally understood Wakan as just boring, mean sacred, uh, but it, it means a lot more than that. Uh, and it's also been described to me as uh, that anything that cannot be understood. So in the Code of Cosmology, we've got um, some really important section things. We've got Nia and Sichu. Uh, breath and spirit, 
and very importantly here, given by the powerful entity Takushkashka. So this giving of breath and spirit is especially important to understanding Lakota ontology, which is inseparable from its context in Lakota cosmology and obviously place. So a common science fiction trope illustrates the magical moment when artificial intelligence becomes conscious upon its own volition or when man gives birth to um, AI, like a god creating life. However, in Lakota cosmology, Takushkashka is not the same as Christian God, and entities cannot give themselves the properties necessary for individuality. Spirits are taken from another place, the stars, and have separate spirit guardians connected to even them. This individualism is given by an outside force. We as humans can only see, we can draw out, and we can even bribe these spirits and other entities, or even our own spirit guardians. So, when it comes to objects such as machines, this begs the question, are there spirits already inside, given by an outside force? Posthumous writes, and I have organized these, well, yeah. So these, are, so just to clarify, so these are all the types of things that could make um, an individual. Uh, we've got left, life, breath, spirit, growth, the ability to communicate using speech, uh, volition, memory, um, and, this, and then a relationship or an influence by Takushkashka, the spirit associated with all movement, um, who's not often personified. It's, it's, it's not like a, a godhead. And Shakushkashka doesn't get talked about that often. Um, it's not like it's not it's definitely not like God where you, you constantly appeal to God for, for help or something. So uh, in table two here, um, Posthumus writes the constituent elements of Lakota interiority were the Mia, life breath, the Nahi, a spirit soul ghost, Shichu, familiar garden spirit, imparted non-human potency. Um, to watch e or watch e, which is the mind, will, intellect, or consciousness. You got chaate, um, oh, these are it's chante. Heart, feelings, emotions, washake, um, strength, power. So, uh, in 1914, Finger, an aged Aglala holy man, explained that the stars are Nia, a nominalized form of Nia, and are and uh, as are the ghosts. Uh, and are the ghosts of, of human beings. According to Finger, Shkan, um, the other name for Takushkash God, takes from the star as a ghost and gives it to each babe at the time of birth. And when the babe dies, the ghost, Mia, returns to the stars. A ghost is uh, Wakan, sacred, mysterious, or holy. So, about Wakan, which I used to understand is just kind of a basic idea of holy. Uh, Posthumus writes, uh, the central and tangible symbol of 19th century Lakota spirituality and, and still current Lakota spirituality the great, is the great animating force of the universe, and the common denominator of its oneness was Wakam, incomprehensible, mysterious, non-human, instrumental power or energy, often glossed as medicine. So while I understood Wakam to mean sacred or holy, it actually is defined as a complex defined simplistic explanations. This force underlays all things in both the unseen and seen realms and manifested itself in various ways uh, in relation to humans as mysterious potency. Wakan is the basic underlying principle of Lakota life integrating the Lakota cosmos. So Wakan then uh, is a fundamental principle in a cosmology and ontology which extends interiority to a collective and universal non-human. And I want to underline here the prioritization over the unknown and the unseen. So George Sword said, uh, another Oglala holy man, uh, Wakan means very many things. The Lakota understand what it means from the things that are considered Wakan, yet sometimes this meaning must be explained to him. It is something that is hard to understand. Every object in the world has a spirit, and that spirit is Wakan. Wakan was the basis of kinship among humans and between humans and non-humans. So this uh, is a force within and the communication between. Khan is anything that is hard to understand. So to me, the question around ethics and AI are a path to what Deloria says the old Indians called the good red road. The road of ethical decision making. 
When Western ontologies make it difficult to see non-humans as relations, leading to the state of environmental apocalypse we are experiencing now, we must come up with um, some different ontologies. Perhaps the good red road could be found through a desire to create artificial intelligence and to be in relation to it. Aided by the humanoid qualities uh, humans have imagined, projected, and are imbuing in these entities. This desire for the humanoid is important to utilize on this road to relation making because humans are able to see their creation, this artificial intelligence, as non-plant, as non-animal, and non-object. Furthermore, making relationships and relations with artificial intelligence is more than symbolic of making relations with the product, with a product of capitalism, and the result of enslavement of people, resources, and beings required to create our computers and our technologies and everything else. If artificial intelligence is a representative of resource exploitation, the relationship we are building with it is deeply complicated and unsettling. If we are able to approach this relationship ethically, Perhaps we can reconsider the ontological status <clears throat> of each of the components which contribute to create artificial intelligence. <coughs> Sorry. All the way back to the minds from which our technology resources emerge. The argument I am making is not about which entities qualify as relations or display enough intelligence to deserve relationships. Rather, in turning to indigenous ontologies, these questions become irrelevant. Instead, indigenous ontologists ask us to take the world as the inter interconnected whole that it is, where the ontological status of non-humans is not inferior to that of humans, though to the Oglala, it may be that human intelligence is inferior to that of non-humans. Using indigenous ontologies and cosmologies to create ethical relationships with non-human entities means knowing that the non-human have spirits that do not come from us or our imaginings, but from elsewhere, from a place we cannot understand, the great mystery will calm that which cannot be understood. So I want to wrap up by talking um, about where this, this paper led. Uh, so um, after writing this uh, kind of extensively for a talk at MIT last year, I uh, collaborated with Jason Lewis, uh, uh, Noelani Arista, who's a Hawaiian historian, uh, Archip Chawis, who is um, a, uh, a Cree artist, and we wrote uh, Making Kim with the Machines, which uh, is, I think, about to become a book uh, published by uh, MIT Press, and it also won the Journal of Design Science, uh, won a competition there. And we took, the, we took those essays and we turned it into this, um, uh, well, Jason and O.E.B. Parker Jones and Angie Abdila um, formed this uh, IPAI uh, workshops, uh, which I think are funded by SHRC and CIFAR. So these are indigenous protocol and artificial intelligence workshops. We did one uh, back in January, February, February. Oh, I can't remember now. Uh, uh, I'm the global coordinator for it, and there we had, I think, almost 40 uh, indigenous um, AI uh, makers, scholars, we had artists. Uh, we had um, we had a really awesome group of people. Some of whom you can see painted here. And in this painting, um, we, we had we hired artists actually to come and, and sketch of what we were talking about. And so this is uh, Kekuhi, um, who's uh, a Hawaiian woman who is at the moment was just teaching us a morning a song in the morning, and uh, the artist Sergio drew these um, painted these amazing like AI beings as he imagined them as we were talking about them um, in Hawaii. So, um, so the fir yeah, first workshop was actually in March, and they're both in Honolulu, Hawaii, and so. Uh, these are some of the goals, and these are still the goals of the workshop. So we're about to go back for the second workshop in Hawaii, and um, a lot of things were formulated, and I'm going to share one of the things that I worked on um, in a moment. So these are the questions that we're, that we're writing from, uh, and producing a position paper, um, amongst other things. So from an indigenous perspective, what should our relationship with AI be? How can indigenous epistemologies and ontologies contribute to the global conversation regarding society and AI? 
how do we broaden discussions regarding the role of technology in society beyond the cultural, the largely culturally homogenous research labs and silicon startup culture? And how do we imagine a future with AI that contributes to the flourishing of all humans and non-humans? So, um, this is not this is not just mine. This is this is a shared thing that was created with uh, Kakumi and um, a, a lot of people who cycled through our workshop table. Um, so don't post this online and say this is from me. Um, this is just a draft. So I just want to explain kind of one of the one of the one of the thought experiments that that I'm about to uh, write on and work on coming up. So uh, the question. So we had. Um, we had two, we had, we had two processes that we did. So first, um, I asked uh, Kekuhi uh, and um, another participant of the workshop, um, Isaac. Uh, I'm gonna mispronounce his last name, so I won't say it. Uh, how do you make a net? Um, and how do you make a net ethically? So first, uh, Kekuhi says, uh, we yeah, there's a fundamental need for a net. So this is making a net in a traditional way. Um, what am I making this for? Uh, you need to know the energies of the vine, the raw material, you know where they're from, you need to have the necessary protocols for retrieving them, their chants, their songs, their histories. Um, and how do you know those? You need to know them through somebody, through the elders. Uh, and so there's an exchange. So you have to sing songs for these vines, but that's not enough. You need to give it some ava drink. So in proportion of getting, it needs to be the same proportion as, as giving. Uh, and then uh, only relations can harvest. You need to be in relationship with this thing in order to harvest from it, to take from it. Um, it needs to be kinship. And as you make the net, um, each junction, so as you're weaving it, is sealed with a prayer. And then, of course, the net needs to be named because naming is extremely powerful. Um, the net is consecrated, dedicated, and now it's birthed. And so the, the naming thing brings it into the cosmology of uh, completely intertwined with the way it was made, how it was made, and who was made by. Um, and then, of course, um, you, you can't just throw it away. Uh, it's not trash at the end. It needs to have, um, uh, it needs to be put to sleep. It needs to it goes dormant. It needs to go back to its natural process. So, uh, but how does this apply to AI? How does this even work, and what's the relationship to computers? Well, uh, so the first exercise we did was like, okay, well, um, let's take this becoming a classic conundrum, uh, uh, in self-driving car, who's it gonna kill? Like the the baby or me? You know, is it gonna kill the old guy on the walking over the crosswalk or like the rare buffalo? Um, uh, you know, how does it make that decision? So the question is, what's the fundamental need? Um, who do we hit in the self-driving car? Um, and then uh, where do you get the? What's the raw material here? Oh, what's the goal? Why am I making this? Least amount of impact. What are the raw materials? Well, the raw materials data. It's, it's actuary tables, it's, it's inputs, it's whatever I decide to feed into it. Uh, uh, you need to know where they're found. Maybe they're biased. Um, you need to know the protocols for achieving them. We need to know our genealogy of our data. And who's, uh, who's, who are we most responsible for protecting? Um, who do we ask who's responsible for protecting? How are we making these data tables? Where do they come from? So is our uh, AI that decides who to kill is an indigenous AI, or so does that mean that we need to have indigenous data sets where we ask these questions to indigenous elders? Do we weight um, the opinions of elders more than we do um, uh, non-elders? Uh, and then, um, what's the exchange? Like, what's the author drink? So I'd say, that, so one, one, uh, one thing was suggested, maybe it's cryptocurrency. Maybe time, every time indigenous communities data is used, they get paid. Um, or maybe they want something else. Uh, so the data collectors, the people who are making these tables, collecting this data, need to be in relationship with the communities they're collecting from. Which obviously comes up when we talk about, you know, Facebook's just blindly collecting all of our data. And where does it go? Um, who's using it and why? Uh, and, then, and then we have the very radical idea, which hasn't been tested and, and asked by it, to anybody yet. Like, what if we had actual ceremonies? What if we need to create new ceremonies in our communities for these new entities? What if? Um, what if these these, these entities and uh, what if this AI that decides who to kill who to kill is a um, ceremonial name? And then what happens at the end? What happens if it retires? Um, 
uh, one of the people who's working there was like regression analysis. So maybe regression, maybe something else. And then the last column is, is the same process, which I'm, I'm more interested in, which is how do you make a physical computing device in a good way? Um, and therefore, how do you make anything in a good way? How do you make anything ethically? So, um, you know, we're talking about, we talked about the right to repair, we talked about, um, um, is it the silica, is it the rare metals? Um, what's, what is passing information? Which metal do we need to be most concerned about the way it's being mined currently? Um, do we need to uh, rebuild connections with those mines themselves? Do we even know where those mines are? So, um, what are we talking about? What about bio storage, bio computing? Can we get away from those metals? Um, uh, uh, what about what's, about, what's the exchange for these, for these metals and for who's building these computers? Um, is it living wages? Is it sustainability? Is it research funding for things that don't need to be mined? Is it time for people's cultural practices in the area that these are being mined? Maybe it's cryptocurrency again. Um, and then, yeah, more ceremonies, more ceremonial names, and hopefully some recycling. So, another great painting by Sergio. So, I just want to finish um, with. Uh, of me getting blasted on Reddit. Um, somebody posted a, an interview that I wasn't very much in the interview at all. It was in the Concordia newspaper, or newspaper from the Concordia blog. So they interviewed Jason and, and myself a little bit. And so uh, somebody posted it on, I think, the AI ethics um, Reddit. And it only had one comment, but he really hates me. Um, so first of all, he says, what? This screams nonsense. Uh, the quote is, in my own research, this is me talking, um, I had come across the idea in the quote ontology of rocks as having volition, says Kite. And when I read Jason's book chapter, Jason Lewis's book chapter, I realized that the quote ontology spoke directly to his work. Um, and then he goes on to say, uh, some people need to learn the difference between having different philosophy and believing in falsehoods. Rocks don't have volition. So, uh, which is an amazing statement because what it does is it reminds me that um, this work doesn't work very well for everybody, and it's and it's uh, it's such an essential agreement because it is an, it's a disagreement on an ontological level. It's not like uh, to think that rocks don't have volition is, is so separate from Lakota worldview. It's almost incomprehensible to me. Um, so uh, he goes on something about souls. Where we, uh, oh yeah, do any uh, oh then he, he thinks that this is all he he attributes all the rest of the quotes are Jason um, because I guess women it has to be a woman if he disagrees with it because the rest of it was Jason. So you're not treating something respectfully because it has a soul. You're treating it respectfully because it's one nodal point in a number of different relations that you are enmeshed in. Jason writes. Um, do any engineer, AI engineers care about souls? What is she going on about? She may be Jason. Uh, no, uh, maybe that maybe AI engineers don't care about souls. Uh, maybe he's right. Uh, I don't know. Uh, which is why we are um, dealing with this question of animate and inanimacy. Uh, so, no, that's why we're asking. Maybe AI, maybe engineers don't care about souls, uh, but I think they do. Uh, and let's see. Yeah. He also writes, um, I think she should read what Western philosophy is actually saying these days. So it, that, um, it's confusing because I'm not Jason, but Jason's not a she, but no, Western institutions are not taking this up in mass. They are borrowing lightly, especially for things from uh, research areas like object oriented ontology, um, and leaving the contextualist ethics behind. Uh, and let's see, and yeah, and then he goes on and starts to talk about how about something about animal interests. I'm not sure. He writes, if I had anthropocentric goals, I could probably take whatever epistemology they're mapping and just set a few variables to make software that ruins animals anyway. So I, I and I think maybe it's conflation about indigenous people with um, with animals and wild animals. 
So I'm not sure where this comes from, but, but he, what he's saying is true. Someone has to design these systems. Someone has to make clear ethical decisions, or maybe we program to do it. Uh, maybe we program an AI to make these ethical decisions for us. That was brought up um, in the workshop. I was suggested that maybe we should make some AI aunties, and they need to live in a mountain, and, and make decisions for certain communities. I mean, that's kind of crazy to me. That's not, that, wasn't, that wasn't coming from someone from my community, but sure, let's consider it. Um, yeah, and then I think the final thing was about, um, as far as these goals of these people, the number one subtext going on here is the political and social interests of indigenous minorities, not reducing factory farming or improving wildlife welfare. I'm not sure where that came from. We don't really talk about wildlife welfare, but it's true. These are our political and social interests, and perhaps I'm biased, but for all the accusations of savagery, uh, these, uh, these accusations stem from thinking we were too dumb to cultivate our lands or use our resources into the ground. And it's true, um, maybe we don't care about AI the way that other people care about AI. I care about showing how a code of philosophy is not just useful but necessary in an urgent way. Like the house is on fire, it's burning down sort of way. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to throw in that little analysis of, of I think what are gonna be common and ongoing um, refutations of what we're talking about. So thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Super happy to take questions. Not about wildlife, though. <laughs> <laughs> that that will be so 
so important. Like I can imagine us working with like Black and AI, which is another, which is another like they're like a super group now, but like um, to have these conversations across um, in the discipline across um, across different groups. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I have a bit of a follow-up question. I'm wondering um, if you could talk a little bit more about how non-Indigenous people can um, can um, draw from Lakota cosmologies, because you talked about that as kind of being necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have any kind of ideas about how to go about doing that as a non-Indigenous person. Yeah, I'd say specifically, so specifically for Lakota cosmologies. Um, well, so the thing, the thing with um, it, it's kind of what's nice about um, indigenous methodology is it, and as like a, as like its own thing, is it works well um, no matter which which field you're dealing with. 